Well, hello. It's great to be here. I'm going to tell you a story today that intersects my life in brain surgery, neural stem cells, and brain cancer. And I call it Beyond Brain Surgery. And I think Beyond Brain Surgery is science and biology, and that's the future. Uh, in my work, daily work, I get to see the, human, the live human brain almost every day. And every day I'm, I'm absolutely marveled at how this tan-colored, three-pound organ uh, dictates and um, is embedded within our feelings, our emotions, our skills, our knowledge. How is it that biological pulsating tissue uh, can be, be the essence of who we are? And certainly, uh, I, I love this quote from uh, this physicist, this theoretical physicist from the US, who says, uh, who says um, the human brain has 100 uh, billion neurons, each neuron connected to 10,000 other neurons. And, and sitting on your shoulders is the most complicated uh, object in the known universe. Just the complexity of the human brain is absolutely astounding. And 200 years ago, we had a simple view of, of what was going on in the brain based on examination of patients and understanding of of uh, diseases that affected them and affected their functions, and then studying their brains after to see which, which regions were involved. And so we had this map for, for movement um, of different parts of the body and different areas of, of feeling. But now, with functional MRI, with d diffusion tensor imaging, we have an exquisite map. Of, we can obtain an exquisite map for every person's brain. And it's not that uh, a textbook can't tell the story of each person's brain. We need to actually write a textbook for each individual person's brain. And here you can see all the different bundles of nerves that are interconnecting throughout uh, a human brain. And as well, Jeffrey Lickman from Harvard University has devised a method in animals where he can label um, individual neurons with different colors to study the the cell to cell connectivity uh, of the of the brain, and certainly these approaches will come to humans in the future. But this is is changing the way we think about how these different circuits define uh, the essence of who we are and how we function. Now, as a neurosurgeon, we're not we're not quite at the cellular level, but certainly these advances in technology are enabling us to do brain surgery safer than we've ever been able to do before. Um, we can take this information, not just the anatomy, not just the shape of the brain, but we can take uh, these maps of the different functions. Um, for, these, for, for example, we can take language and uh, we can uh, pinpoint where language is in the brain so we know if we have a lesion to remove in the brain, we can go around the language area to remove the lesion and keep the person's language functions intact. And we can integrate this with computer systems so when we're doing surgery, we can point to areas in the head or in the brain that tell us exactly where we are with respect to the imaging and the different uh, functional pathways that we want to protect and preserve. And so here's, here's um, us we were pointing at the brain in that patient, and this tells us relative to the scan where we are. And here, just at the bottom left, is, is a tumor deep in this person's brain that we're seeking to remove. And so this is in incredible technology. It's advancing all the time. It's allowing us to, to devise safe and better access to make brain surgery safer and safer. And, and as well, we have microscopes that allow us to um, operate at, uh, at a millimeter by millimeter level. So I could spend uh, four hours in an area the size of the end of my thumb to remove uh, a tumor, for example, and, and carefully tease it away from, from nerves that might be responsible for a person swallowing or, or their ability to, to speak, for example. And so all of these tools we have now at our disposal. So brain surgery has never been safer. And so it allows us to, to confront a very difficult problem like this um, with some confidence. So here, this, this was a six-year-old girl who had headaches. She gets a scan, and she had this 
as you can see in the middle, that bright area is, is a brain tumor uh, within, within the very deepest reaches of her brain. And so we had a real challenge. How do we get to that? This needs to be removed. She's suffering symptoms. And so with those tools, with those maps, we were able to sneak in in between the two halves of the brain and minimally disrupt the brain so as to, to remove that, per that person's tumor. And they woke up beautifully after the operation and um, everyone was relieved and we were all feeling very good about what we were able to do with our hands with this uh, great technology. But the problem with brain tumors is this, is that they come back. And so unfortunately, this person's tumor came back several years later, and it came back in a way that surgery no longer had a role. And so first, as a, as a clinician, and with this knowledge, um, cancer is a leading cause of non-accidental death in Canadian and American children. And brain tumors represent many of these because uh, other types of childhood cancers are being cured at a much higher rate, for example, childhood leukemia. And so for myself, being a brain surgeon and seeing, uh, wanting to always push myself to do better and to go beyond uh, what I'd been taught, I, I, w I wanted to do much more than that. I didn't want surgery to be the last step. I wanted to understand more. And to, for this, we have to turn to biology. What can be done, what can be done is science and scientific research. And this is really what our main problem is. For a lot of cancers, that affect many different systems in the human body, our problem isn't necessarily with, with um, the, f the, first, the first forays into treatment. Still, surgery is a very important part of, of treatment of cancer in many different systems. So it seems like such a crude act to physically remove, but still today, it's still one of the most important things that, that needs to be done in order to treat a person's cancer. But the problem is with recurrence. So recurrence after first treatment is a main obstacle to cure for many cancers, including uh, and especially brain cancer. So one of the cancers that we're very interested in, in which is quite common in, in young, young people, is, is a tumor called medulloblastoma. And so I, I look, turn to thinking about, well, first, what, what do these tumors look like under a microscope? And so this is a typical picture of a medulloblastoma where here, uh, purple is staining the nuclei and pink stains the cytoplasm of the cells. And so here there are many cells packed together and essentially all of this looks quite similar. All the cells morphologically look similar. And so I asked a question, is that really true? Are those cells really truly the same? And so we, we started to ask that question by staining tumors for different markers and we had a clue that cancer of the brain might be like an aberrant developmental process based on stem cells. And I'll come back to that in more detail. But so what we wanted to do, and this, this, this was from a model of, of the same cancer that, that can be modeled in an animal, and we stained cells within that tumor uh, with different markers. And so these, these are markers, SOX2, DCX, and NUN. They represent markers of stem cells progenitor cells, and mature cells of the normal brain. And so we find these normal markers also in the tumor. And this suggests that maybe there's a relationship between those cells. Maybe uh, this type of cancer represents an abnormal stem cell system. And a key point here is that the stem cells, which express this gene called SOX2, are relatively few, but we think those are the key cells. So we, faced with that initial information, we wanted to ask this question, are relationships between stem cells and their more mature daughter cell progeny maintained in a cancer context? And I'm going to show you, tell you, show you a little bit of, of, of some experiments that suggest that the answer to that is yes. There's a lot of excitement now over the last 20 years that our brain is more dynamic than we ever thought before because um, there are several regions in the brain where there are new neur neurons made in the brain that, that may play a role in, for example, in memory formation in a part of the brain called the hippocampus, which is on the inner part of the temporal lobe. And perhaps making neur new neurons is essential to being able to generate new memories. But so the stem cells um, 
reside within, they generate other cells that amplify the number of cells because they divide frequently, and ultimately they undergo a process called differentiation or maturation into cells that are neurons or glia, which are astrocytes or oligodendrocytes, supporting cells for the neurons. And so in the normal context, during development, that process works as, as a baby's brain grows during development, and there's, there's more robust activity of that early on in life in humans, and there's, that diminishes over time. But in the normal context, to make that beautiful brain that you saw those pictures of, th these processes are extremely tightly regulated and are beautifully orchestrated. Um, and I, I like this image from one of my favorite records that, that, that illustrates uh, the, this process. But in cancer, we think, oh, those are, there's a resemblance to that, those kind of relationships. It's now gone haywire. But there are some clues within that tell us what we can do. So another key point is cancers often represent distortions of our normal selves. And to take that one step further in the brain is brain cancers represent aberrant developmental processes. And brain cancers, we think, grow because they contain genetically abnormal stem cells that are, our, if you will, on a misguided mission to grow abnormal brain tissue. And so we need to understand that process. And so uh, I'm just going to show you one example of one experiment that supports these, this idea. And it's, it's a classical experiment that, that scientists who are interested in development of tissues does. It's, it's something called a lineage trace. And it's a definitive measurement uh, of the potency of a cell that's marked in a tissue. And it tells us whether how, how well that tissue can replenish and how, how, the, how that tissue matures. And we wanted to ask this question. Those 5%, those few little green cells I showed you in that picture that express this gene, key gene called SOX2, could those cells be at the roots of growth of this type of childhood tumor? And so a graduate student in my lab, Robert Vanner, did the experiment. It was a very difficult experiment. But what he was able to do is he could... We used a genetic trick that was embedded into uh, animals that would, that would grow up medulloblastomas naturally. And this model is very close to, the, to the sharing the same genetic changes and the same, um, the tumors look the same as the human tumors. They express the same abnormal genetic programs as a human tumor. So we thought it was, a, it was a terrific model. And here was something that you actually can't do in a human being, but you can do in a very good animal model. So what Robert was able to do is he could mark these SOX2 positive cells and show initially that these were few cells in the tumor. And then what we did is we followed that tumor over time to trace the progeny of these marked cells. And essentially what happens here is that cell becomes, acquires a color, acquired this red color. And when that cell divided and generated two daughter cells, both the daughter cells became red. And then as they divided, both their daughter cells become red. And over time, we, we wanted to watch to see if the tumor turned red. And essentially, and here's the real experiment, it shows that the tumor grows based on the division and multiplication of a rare population of cells that reside within, strongly supporting that this, this type of tumor is driven in a, based on an aberrant stem cell system. So on the right, you can see over several weeks, the tumor essentially turns red, and it came from few cells. So these cells, we think, are at the root of the growth of, the, of this kind of cancer. And the key thing here is we then started to test uh, conventional treatments in, in, in this model to see how do the conventional treatments uh, target these different cell types in these, in these tumors. And essentially what we found here is that the usual treatments were, were fantastic at killing a lot of the cells in the tumor. We found good drugs already that also work in patients that are very good at, at shrinking these tumors and, and improving uh, the s symptoms. But, but what you may not be able to see so well here, but on the right is after the treatment, we see more red cells in this tumor. And what that means is that the, we spared a population of cells. We're leaving something behind. 
we're leaving a reservoir of cells behind that may show the capacity to regrow the tumor. And, and so in, in applying this stem cell biology approach, this developmental framework, if you will, to thinking about how cancer grows, we can start to divide up different cell types in the tumor into distinct compartments. I'm not gonna go over all of this, but essentially there are a few cells that, are, that have a stem cell property that actually another key point about those cells is that they're very slowly dividing. They, they, and and, and our, our general treatments for cancer are very good at targeting cells that are rapidly dividing. We figure that process out. But we haven't figured out so well how to deal with cells that are lurking within the cancer that maybe have a very slow dividing potential. It seems like the drugs that we have don't target these slowly cycling cells. Those cells in turn generate progeny that divide fast, which are cancer progenitors, which respond to chemotherapy, which we can wipe out. And eventually those cells undergo a maturation process, not like the normal brain, but still re resembling the normal brain. Uh, but these cells that mature actually are short-lived and, and are eliminated. And although they form a component of the mass of the tumor, which can cause symptoms, they actually disappear over time. They're programmed to disappear. And it may be analogous to what also happens in the developing brain. We, during development, we generate way more, ma way more neurons than we need. Um, and as those neurons start to make connections, a lot of the extra neurons are pruned. So we, there may be this process that's also being recapitulated in, in this cancer context. But what this tells us also is that we need different types of treatments for these different types of cells. And, and applying the stem cell thinking m means we, don't, we, not, we not only have to target the fast dividing cells, we need something that, that t targets the slow dividing cells. Or maybe all, what we should do is just force all of these cells to mature into these um, differentiated cell types, and then those cells will, cells will have a limited lifespan and will disappear. So I think one of the key points I want to get across today, and I think it applies generally to cancer, is not every cancer is functionally created equal. Even if they may have the same genetic changes, they're not behaving the same way. And we need to figure that out. So cancer is much more than genetic mutations. Genetic mutations are essential to get cancer growing, are essential to be cancer, but, it, but it's how those genetic ch changes are being used by the cells that also dictates the way that cancer behaves. So we think that cancer reflects how genetic changes shape the behavior of normal tissue growth and regenerative processes. And in our, in our group, we've identified a cellular target in medulloblastoma of children, also in glioblastoma of adults. And we're, we're starting to characterize more the programs that, that dictate the behavior of those cells. And we think that we have the cell in hand that is responsible for uh, the root growth of these tumors, but also responsible for the recurrence. Having these cells at hand gives us the chance to discover new therapies that may, more, that may better affect long-lasting cures. So I think there is hope for a better future for, for children and adults with brain cancer based on applying this kind of framework to understanding uh, brain cancer. And, it, and really, as someone who started off as a clinician, as a surgeon, um, I love what I do in looking after uh, patients and being able to use my hands and to be able to have a dramatic impact on someone's life with an operation, but I recognize that still there's limitations in what we can do with our hands. And I, I think we're not, we're not yet to be replaced by robots uh, because still there's aspects of, of uh, the human uh, motor and sensory systems that still can't be replaced by robots. So we need surgeons but we need much more than surgery. We need to understand biology. And I think the, the key for, for young people uh, is science. Um, Canada and the world needs more uh, people engaged in scientific research to ask creative, original questions and uh, to think outside the box. We think, in a way, we thought outside of the box in, lo in looking at brain cancer this way, and we're very hopeful of what that might mean for the future. Thank you very much for your attention.